All right. Well, thank you, Brother Patrick. Let's take our Bibles now and turn to Psalms 133. Psalms chapter 133 and verse 1. I'll just read the one verse. And when you stand that with, uh, when you find that stand, please, I mean to say, familiar verse to us, one that I've spoken on before. We will revisit the subject tonight. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in, say it with me, unity. One verse again, I'll just read it. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. The implication is that it's unpleasant to dwell together without unity. And so certainly that is the case. Now, um, I want to talk to you about the subject of a standard measure. A standard measure. And uh, you'll see why that's the title here in just a little bit, okay? And so let's pray together. You can be seated. Father, we thank you for allowing us to gather together on this Sunday night. I so often thank you for that, but I mean it every time because nobody has to be here. None of these folks are compelled to be here. They're here because they love you and they love truth and they love each other and they love church. And I just pray that you would bless each one for being here and that you'd help, help each one to, uh, to just have the mind of Christ and that we would just be yielded and fully surrendered to thee. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. You may be seated. The word unity means a unit. If you look up the Hebrew word that is translated unity in this verse here, it literally means a unit. And a unit is something, the definition is, it is a single thing. It is one thing. So the teaching here is that it is so pleasant for brethren to dwell together being one. That's unity. All throughout the Bible, we see us being encouraged to have unity. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, though the word unity does not appear in this verse, certainly that is the teaching of the verse. Because we are told, number one, to all speak the same thing, which is, by the way, the basis of unity, and that there be no divisions among you, and that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. It describes unity. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, it says, finally, brethren, farewell, be perfect and of a and of good comfort, be of one mind. And then Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3 encourages us, it says, in endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. And by the way, you can never separate the Holy Spirit from His Word because He gave us the Word. Some try to suggest, well, I can be, have the unity of the Spirit and disagree with the Bible. That's impossible. Because God always honors the word he gave us. He is the author of the word, and anything or anyone that speaks against that cannot be in unity with him. Then Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind. And then Colossians chapter 2 and verse 2 says that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance and understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God 
and of the Father and of Christ. And then finally, 1 Peter 3, 8, finally, be all of one mind, that's unity, having compassion one of another, love his brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. So again, the word unity means a unit. It means one thing. I mean, if you go to, back when I was in the car business, they, they would call the cars or the trucks units. And we would say, how many units do you have on the ground? We'd say, well, we've got 500 units. That means we've got 500 automobiles. Each automobile is a unit. So unit means one. It means a single thing. <laughs> so, the, <laughs> excuse me. so we then as brethren, the Bible says it is pleasant, it is, it is pleasurable that we would dwell together, and we do dwell together. We, we are a family. We are a society, if you will that we dwell together in unity, being one. The local church is spoken of as being one body, not two, not a collection of bodies, but one. Now, I, I um, will say this. The Bible teaches us unity. The Bible exalts <laughs> unity. But the world exalts diversity. Now, um, the great buzzword, of course, in our land now is diversity. Celebrate, they say, diversity. Well, I can celebrate all the different flavors at Baskin Robbins, if that's what you're talking about. I can celebrate all the different kinds of donuts at, uh, at uh, some donut place. But, you know, I, I think that... Uh, God certainly is not against diversity. In fact, he created diversity. However, not as some would suggest diversity is today. I mean, for example, not all trees are the same. Not all people look the same. Praise God for that. Not all animals are the same. And God even invented the different languages in the world. The diverse languages all around the world. God did that at Babel. But though there is diversity, there is also truth. And the word truth means fact. It means conformity to fact. That is why I said a few Sundays ago or a few services ago that if something is genuinely a fact, if something is genuinely conformed to truth, it is, in my feeling, inherently absolute. Because something isn't nearly true, it's either true or it isn't. It's either fact or it's fiction, fact or it's not. So if something is conformed to fact, it is absolutely true. Therefore, in my feeling at least, that anything that is genuinely true is by its nature absolutely true. Now, some truths do not allow any diversity. There are some truths that God has set up that do not allow diversity. For example, as far as I know, there's no diversity in gravity. It's a, there's gravity all over the planet. There is no diversity with, in my feeling, the plan of salvation. It is by grace through faith, period. Anything other than that is not the plan of salvation. Now, but there are some truths within which there is an allowance for some diversity. And in fact, I'll say this, Christian liberty is diversity governed by truth. Christian liberty is diversity governed by truth. I'll use the worn out illustration that I always use about this about there being liberty or diversity within the law by the two speed limits that are on the freeway. You just don't have one speed limit. You have two speed limits. <laughs> you have 70, and I like the 70. You have 70, and you have 40. Anywhere you drive between 40 and 70, that's diversity. You can drive 40, 41, 45, 48, 50, 60, 65, 69, 67. All that's good. So there is some diversity built into that kind of a law, but not into every law. 
But Christian liberty, of course, is much abused in our time. People do about everything they want to do, and they sprinkle the word Christian liberty upon it. There's no such thing. Christian liberty has to be governed by truth, or it is rebellion against truth. Doctrinal diversity must be governed by truth. There might be some tiny uh, allowable differences in some doctrine, I guess. I just say that in a theoretical sense. But even those must be governed by truth. Now, here's what I'm getting to. If unity is one, if unity is a single thing, and God teaches us unity, I believe his intention is that we, be unity, we have unity in things like Bible doctrine. I, I think God looks down and he is uh, grieved by the great diversity in things that are taught between one church and another. I, I know he is, in fact. I think he looks down and he says he sees the Methodists and the Baptists and the Presbyterians and the Nazarenes and the Pentecostals who all believe different things about many things. And he says, look, uh, you know, you guys, you guys have strayed from the handbook. And you've carved out your, your, your diversity when there is no diversity in my book that I gave you. So God has a solution to our diversity issue, and that is truth. Now, see, many would say that uh, the solution in the doctrinal issues that we have in the churches is to ignore them. Some would say celebrate them. Some would say uh, just you know, pretend like they don't exist. Some would say honor them. But I think the best solution is to resolve them. And we have really lost the appetite to resolve doctrinal differences between people. Now, the solution is truth. And uh, the solution is conformity to fact. Here's what I say. That if the Methodists and the Baptists and the Presbyterians and the Nazarenes and the Pentecostals were to all be conformed to fact they would all believe exactly the same things. And they would all teach exactly the same things. I mean, uh, what, did, what did Jesus say? He said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Paul Penn, study to guys like me, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know what I mean by standard measure, right? The problem that we have in, in our churches today is we have rejected the concept of a standard measure spiritually. We no longer believe in a standard measure. And, and by the way, the idea of not having a standard measure is not believed in any other science of humanity. Every science, and when I say science, I mean field of endeavor, every other field of endeavor accepts a standard measure. I mean, if you get a, if you get a quart jar out in, in a Flowery Branch, Georgia, and you get a quart jar out in California, they both are the same. If you get a teaspoon out here, you get a teaspoon out in London, England, it's the same. Same amount of stuff. Standard measure. Now see, uh, in my office, I have a, a, tape, re a tape measure. And the tape measure uh, has uh, little marks on it. And they, it says this, that there are 12 inches in a foot. Now, you should write this down. This is deep. 12 inches in a foot. 12 inches in a foot. Now, uh, think about this. In the Bible, there was the cubit. And the cubit, we see, is the difference, difference between here, the distance, rather, between here and here. 
But that is not really a standard measure. You know why? Because your cubit is different than my cubit. Uh, Grant there probably has a longer cubit than I do. And, and uh, Charity back there barely has a cubit. And Tim Autry has a double cubit. And Robert there probably has a double cubit. He's, he's a big, tall man. But a cubit is not a standard measure. That's why, for example, we're not 100% sure how big the ark was. It just said a cubit. Now, that might have been Noah's cubit, probably was. I doubt he'd use somebody else's. And back in those days, it seemed like guys got mighty big, so the ark could have been much bigger than some suggest. But a standard measure is important in every other endeavor of life. And why is it that you and I struggle to accept a standard measure for our faith? Why is it that we struggle to accept a standard measure that tells us how to live? Why is it that we struggle to, to accept a standard measure to tell us how to raise our children and so on? I mean, look, even something as basic as how you're saved. People seem to reject the standard measure of God's Word. Um, and let me say this. A standard measure produces unity because there's 12 inches in a foot for everybody. So if you accept that there are 12 inches in a foot, you are in unity with everybody else as they talk about length and measure. There is no such thing as a foot that is not 12 inches long. Nobody can honestly say that they have a foot that's 11 inches or 13 inches. Think about this. You build a house. You have a concrete man. You have a framer. You have a plumber. You have a sheetrock man. You have a cabinet man, electrician, HVAC man, all, all that kind of stuff. Every one of them uses a standard measure. Every one of them has a measure by which they decide and determine how long something is. All of them look at a set of plans, for example, that say this, uh, like when Jonathan, his brother, put in a trunk line in a, in a building. They look at a plan that says this trunk line is to be thus and so inches long. This many feet and this many inches. They use a standard measure for their work. If you're going to build a home and it's going to turn out right, you have to use a standard way of measuring things. There is no such thing as a plumber's foot. I mean, plumbers have feet. But I'm just saying, a, a, a plumber's foot is the same length as a painter's foot, is the same length as an electrician's foot, is the same length as a framer's foot. The cabinet man's foot is the same as a sheetrock man's foot. And so because they all are using the same measure, and they accept the same measure, they are put in unity by accepting the standard measure. Does that make sense to you? Now, it is the standard measure that brings them into unity. It is when both of them accept the same, same standard of measurement that allows them to be in unity over how long something is. So it is therefore no longer a matter of interpretation or a matter of, of understanding or a matter of opinion. It is measured out 12 inches in a foot. I mean, a couple of years ago, I was going to the Philippines, and I offered some of the guys uh, that had given some money to the PSM. I said, look, I'll bring you back a barong. And they don't give those away, but they're cheap enough. And some of the guys that had given a nice amount of money, I said, let me bring you a barong back as a souvenir. Oh, that'd be great. I said, uh, I said uh, let me have your measurements. Everybody, I said, there's a picture on the Internet. Tell you how to do it. Everybody went home and measured, sent me their measurements, and I sent them on to the Philippines. Everybody got their shirt back. And they were horribly wrong in size. You know why? Because we measured in inches, not in centimeters. They, they use centimeters and we use inches. And I mean, they were terrible off. Now, not only does a standard measure produce unity, it also produces harmony. Harmony. Um, an orchestra has the same set of notes. 
when they get off key, they don't have harmony. As long as they conform to the set of notes that exist, the reality of it, they can all play together and complement one another and be in harmony. Same thing about going back to building a house. I mean, look, if the plumber has a different measurement than the carpenter, you're going to have problems. If the carpenter thinks there's, there's uh, 11 inches in a foot and the sheetrock man thinks there's 13 inches in a foot, their work's not going to jive too well together. You're going to have a monstrosity. You're going to have things that aren't level. You're going to have things that are crooked. You're going to have things that are stepped down when they're supposed to be the same. Why? Because they are not in harmony. They're not in harmony because they do not have the same standard measure. And so they look at the plan and it says, all right, this is supposed to be a 10-foot a wall. But to one guy, a 10-foot wall is two inches longer than another guy because his foot is different in his mind. Now, by the way, that is an absolute fantasy. Why? Because we know that the standard says there are 12 inches in a foot. So it doesn't matter if a guy says, well, I got, I got an 11. Best. My conviction is 11 inches in a foot. Well, guess what, Buster, you're wrong. My conviction is 13 inches. Well, guess what? Uh, they're both wrong. Because we know there's 12 inches in a foot. Why? Because that is, the, that is the standard measure. That is reality. It doesn't matter how strongly one believes error, it is still error. It doesn't matter how sincere one is about their error, it is still error. Also then, a standard measure produces quality. You can't make anything right when you've got different people working on it that have a different set of measurements. It'll be crooked. It'll be crazy looking. Each wall will have a different measurement. One will be long, one will be short, one will be straight, one will be crooked. It ruins the quality of what you're doing. It ruins the fit and finish of what you're doing. Nothing is level. Nothing turns out right. It is a poor quality. Now, let's think about that spiritually just for a moment. Let's apply it to beliefs, to try it, apply it to doctrine. Unity of doctrine, unity of belief. Again, I say to you, think about how many flavors of Christianity there are. And when I say flavors, I don't, I mean it's really much more than just a flavor. There are serious doctrinal differences between groups. I'm talking about things that make the difference between going to heaven or hell. That's not, that's not strawberry or vanilla. That's not a preference. That's a serious doctrinal error. And we have to just face that that's the reality of it. And that that is against God's will. And let me read to you again. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. First Corinthians 1, 10 where it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the, what? Same thing. The same thing. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, uh, what he's saying is, look, knuckleheads, there is one body of truth. All of you believe the same. That's what he's saying. You've got to believe the same because there's one way that I believe. God says, look, I believe this. Your job is to believe what I believe, not to make up your own flavor, not to change it, not to turn it, not to corrupt it. You, I believe this. You are to believe that. And so that's what he's saying. Look, you folks, you're supposed to believe God says what I believe, not what you want to believe. And when you try to deny what I believe or, or debate what I believe, you're creating something that is untrue because I don't believe that. And all of you are supposed to believe the same exact thing. Think about this. There is Baptist doctrine. All right, I've been three things in my life. I've been a Baptist, Methodist, and Pentecostal. Now, I wasn't an involved Pentecostal. I, I shouldn't say I have been a Pentecostal. I went to a Pentecostal church for a couple of years. I never embraced much of their teaching. 
Um, but I, I attended it for a couple of, year, couple of years. I never embraced tongues, of course. I never embraced um, illusion of salvation, of course. I mean, I didn't know much about the Bible. At least I knew that much about those two things. So I've, I've been around it a little bit. There's Baptist doctrine. There's Methodist doctrine. There's Pentecostal doctrine. There's Presbyterian doctrine. And there is uh, Na Nazarene doctrine, other doctrines. So you got Baptist doctrine, Methodist doctrine, Presbyterian doctrine, Pentecostal doctrine, Nazarene doctrine, but there is no Baptist Bible, Methodist Bible, Presbyterian Bible, Pentecostal Bible, Nazarene Bible. God didn't say to the Nazarene, hey, good news, I got your own special book for you. It backs up everything that you want to believe. He didn't say to the Baptist, hey, buddy, I know what you want to believe. Got it right here. Wrote it for you. No. Uh, there is a Bible. There's no Baptist Bible, no Methodist Bible, no Presbyterian Bible, no Pentecostal Bible. God did not give the Baptists one Bible and the Presbyterians another Bible. He did not give the Baptists a Bible that teaches salvation by grace through faith and then turn around and give the Church of Christ a Bible that teaches salvation by baptism. He didn't give the Baptists a Bible that teach that a pastor has to be a man and the Pentecostals one that says a woman can be a pastor. God didn't do that. God did not give the Presbyterians a Bible that teach that only some pre-chosen people can be saved and the Baptists one that teach that everybody can be saved. God did not give the liberals one Bible and the conservatives another Bible. We have one Bible. We have one belief. We have one set of truths that God has given us. Now, uh, we have complicated that. We have messed that up. But God had no part in that. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have watered down and confused truth in our era horribly. But that's not God's fault. And things are so messed up now. that a call for unity is interpreted as a call for contention. And when someone says we all should believe the same, it's offensive because we honor diversity beyond what God intended. We should honor truth. And we should be able to resolve the doctrinal differences to have unity. And, and the world cries, celebrate diversity! Uh, and, they'll, and they'll cry, also celebrate unity. But here's what, here's what I'm talking about the world as in the Christian world. What they often call unity is actually more like union. It's not really unity at all. It's union. Um, a union is when people unite to work together, though they not necessarily agree on everything. Illustration. We live in the United States of America but we are not in unity. I mean, look, Georgia is united with Alabama and united with New York and even California and Nevada and Arizona, but we are not in unity with them. We have one set of laws. They have another. They have, look, in some states, abortion is legal more than in others. In some states, marijuana is legal, not in others. In some states, uh, concealed carry is, is legal, not in others. So each state has its, has its own speed limits. It used to be they had a federal law, 55 miles an hour everywhere. Boy, that was a bummer. I hated that. And I was so happy when they lifted that. But every state gets to set their own speed limits. And every state has many laws that are unique to that state, or at least they have the the sovereignty to have their own laws in many areas. So, so we are the United States, but we are not in unity with all the other states. Likewise, that is the way that it is spiritually to a great degree. In other words, what some say, put your differences aside and join together, that's not unity. That's union. Consider this. The word union is nowhere in the Bible. And there is not any positive encouragement in the scriptures that I've ever found to be in the union with someone with which you severely disagree. And so they, 
they are, they are promoting something that is falsely named as unity, but it is actually union. And so they tell us to do something that we really cannot do. They tell us to be in unity despite our severe doctrinal differences. This cannot really happen because if you have differences, you cannot be in unity because unity is one. It is a single thing. We can be in union. We can, we can be in union with the Presbyterians, but we can't be in unity with them. We can be in union with the Methodists, with the Pentecostals, but we can't be in unity with them. The word union, again, is not found in Scripture. By the way, unity is what God's choice is, is so much better than union ever could be. Why set a goal so low as to settle for union when God says, have unity? Unity demands that all those involved, or I'm sorry, union demands that all those involved compromise just a little bit for the sake of getting together, to work together. Unity says, look, let's all embrace the same truth, which is fact, and when we do that, we don't have to worry about being together. We're already together. See, unity says, here's truth. There it is. This is fact. And if I accept that as fact, and Zach in fact accept that as fact, then he and I are in unity. We don't have to say, hey, listen, let's try to be in unity. Let's try to get along now. Let's try to be in unity. No, we don't even have to talk about it. We don't have to think about it. Why? Because all we have is, we know what this is. This is a mic stand. It's made out of metal. It's got three legs. It's black. And that's unity. If he accepts that, and I do, we are automatically in unity. I don't have to fake it or fudge it or pretend it or, or trump it up. That's unity. And that is much better. It is much, much better than union ever could be. I'll tell you this too. Unity is much stronger than union. You know, in the Civil War, many of the states in the South succeeded from the United States. There was a disunion. They, that's what succession is. They disunioned themselves from the United States. They did that because they were already at disunity. And their disunity got to the place to where they said, we're out. And so, but unity is so strong if you're one, if you're truly one, it takes a lot to get you to be two. Like splitting an atom, it takes a lot. If you're really together, you're really on the same page, it takes a lot to get you to split and to divide. But a union can break up rather easily because it is more lightly tied together. So unity is much stronger than union. Another thing is this. God actually commands disunion in some cases. Now this is what folks don't enjoy hearing. Romans 16, 17 says this, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the what? Doctrine. Which ye have learned and avoid them. In other words, he's talking about the people that bring those contrary doctrines to you you are to identify them, mark them. Okay, there's one. By the way, that is why preachers like me have to name names. That's unpleasant for me too. Now you shouldn't name names. Look, I have to mark false teachers. How can I mark them if I don't give you a name? Now you may not enjoy that. In fact, I don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy anything that I know you may not enjoy. But I feel like I am under an obligation to do what God says and mark them. I can't mark them without identifying them. To identify them, I must name them. And unless you know who they are, you cannot avoid them. So there are some doctrinal differences that are so important, God commands the brethren to be in disunity, assuming the other ones really are brethren. But he says, you know, you've got to avoid them. We cannot unite with those God has commanded us to divide from. We cannot be in union even with those that God has commanded us to divide from. Another thing is this. Saying 
that you are in unity does not make you in unity. There is a lot of feigned or pretended unity in Christendom today. There's a lot of, we call it fake news. There's a lot of fake unity out there. Another thing, silence does not make unity. Just because we stop calling other people out about things that we feel like are dangerously wrong does not make us in unity. It makes us silent. If I were to stop crying out against false doctrine, that would not put me in unity with those teachers. It would just mean I'm not saying anything. That's all it would mean, that I'm not talking about them. doesn't mean we're in unity. I mean, look, think about this. Think about the, the Church of Christ preacher and the Methodist preacher and the Presbyterian preacher. Well, the Presbyterian preacher, if he believes classic Presbyterian doctrine, believes in predestination. Predestination is that God has chosen who's to be saved from eternity past and that nobody can change that. We call it hyper-Calvinism. Now, there are some Presbyterians that don't believe that, but that is a classic position uh, penned by John Calvin. Now, that, uh, that, they, that God has chosen who's to be saved, it is written in stone, it's like fate, and that no man can change that. Well, the Methodists don't believe that, and the Church of Christ don't believe that. And the Baptists don't believe that. And if we got together and did something together, we still don't believe the same, even though we're ignoring it or being silent about it. So we're not really in unity at all. We might be in union, but we're not in unity. Ignoring our differences does not make us united. Number, number next, I got a number, but I'm all out of order anyway. Cooperation does not make us in unity. Denominations which have vastly different beliefs may cooperate to fight something they both are against. That does not make them truly in unity. Again, it, the, the Catholics and the Charismatics may cooperate to march against abortion. And by the way, I hate abortion. But that doesn't mean they're suddenly in unity. They still have vastly different beliefs. So cooperation does not even make you unified. See, that's cooperate. Let's be unified. No, that's not unity. That's union. And God doesn't command that anywhere. Uh, and get this, I like this one. Of course, I like them all because they're mine. <laughs> the road to unity is often paved with contention. Think about it in the book of Acts when the disciples got to arguing about things like could Gentiles truly be saved? They had, they had a knockdown drag out over it. They were, so, there was a lot of contention there was a lot of arguing and fussing, but at the end of that, they came away unified. Why? Because they got to a place of agreement. And we are told to contend for our faith. Contend for it. So a lot of times, the road to uh, unity has to be paved with debate and contention. Something else I've noticed. Those who cause disunity often accuse others of causing it. The loudest voices in the world today who preach unity are actually the ones causing disunity in many cases. I'll give you an illustration. Um, you go back, goodness now, time goes, goes forward, but uh, let's see, 40, 50, 50 years right? Yeah. Uh, 50 years ago, the New International Version came out. Well, 1901, the American Standard Version came out. I think that's right. So that's 117 years ago. Now, until then, pretty much all of English-speaking Christianity used one book, one Bible, this one I have right here. May have been a different edition, but the text was the same. May have had a different font, but the text is the words are the same. Now, let me within the illustration. Let me give you an illustration. You got a big classroom of people here, and let's say we're studying mathematics, and 
Here are my textbooks. But now, this textbook is not the same book as this one. It's not the same as this one. It's not the same. What about that? Is that one? So you got four math books, but they're not all the same. So you've got all these people studying out of different textbooks, but they're all in the same room trying to study the same subject with four different textbooks. Now, in any classroom in America, any college or public school in America, would they allow that? No. no. So why do we allow that in our churches? Is there a difference? You say, well, well, Pastor, it's all God's Word. Well, we could talk about that, but you could say about this, well, it's all math, right? It's all math. And, it's, and, and you know, it's, if it's math, it's math. Well, not necessarily. If that math book, well, let's say history. That history book's different than this one, different than that one, different than that one. When, when the test comes, when the test comes, what happens? So all I'm saying is this, you know, we, in no other discipline would they allow different textbooks to be used in the same class of people. That would be something crazy. I mean, I went to college a couple times. I have a degree in agronomy as well as theology. I went to the University of Georgia. By the way, they did pretty good yesterday. Sorry about Florida State, Brad. God bless your heart. Man, it tore me up. I mean, just I had I couldn't sleep <laughs> last night. And Josh, we're praying about the game tomorrow, Tennessee. He's playing Georgia Tech. Good night. I wish there's a way they could both lose. I just <laughs> But I went through Georgia. I had I had botany and horticulture and physics and, and math and we never had a class where the teacher said, well, we got 40 different versions of the textbook. If we just come grab you one, they're all good. We had exactly word for word the same textbooks. Now, for the last 100 and some odd years, Christianity has been, has been invaded and thereby divided by multiple textbooks. But yet, when I stand up and say, hey, let's have one, uh-oh, they say, he's dividing the brethren. No, they're already divided. <laughs> you divide them with your umpteen thousand different textbooks. What I'm trying to do is get us back together. Get us back together. See, basically, this church has unity on that subject. We have one textbook. Now, that doesn't say if somebody comes in with something else, we run them off. Certainly not. We don't even look. But we learn from one textbook here. This King James Bible is our textbook. That's what we use. That gives us unity by definition because we have one textbook. So I, what I try to do, and, and by the way, if you read the, what pastors are supposed to do, we're to edify, to teach and bring us into a place of unity. And my job, the Bible says, to hand you the same thing I was handed by other faithful men. It's not my place to change it. I am to hand down the same thing that other faithful men, and that phrase implies they handed me truth. That doesn't mean that no matter what you believe, it was handed to you by somebody else. In other words, if it's error, you don't hand it down. But faithful men, it's truth. They hand it down to you. You hand it to the next generation. So here's what I'm saying. I'm saying, look, if God could just and God gives us free will, so we mess a lot of things up because we're, we're messed up. But if God just did it, what he would do is he'd come through here and he'd do a mind wipe. He'd say, okay, now we're going to start over. And every one of you starts with the same textbook. And I'm going to teach you exactly the same thing. And all of you uh, are going to believe the same thing because that's, God said, because I believe one thing. God said, I don't believe five different ways of salvation. I don't believe in infant baptism and, and adult, uh, adult baptism and, and salvation by works and salvation by grace. I believe in one kind of salvation, not five. And that's what you have to believe if you're going to be like me. It would be sort of like this. Um, 
Do you shake your milk before you drink some? Do you? Who shakes their milk? Raise your hand, you milk shakers. You shake your milk? I do too. I shake my milk. But you know it's unnecessary. Now, I don't know why. You shake your milk because your mama shaked her milk and her mama shaked her milk or shook her milk. All right, but you don't have to shake your milk now because why? Anybody know the word? It's homogenized. Used to be back, back in the day when, you know, Brother Kilgore was a boy, uh, <laughs> the cream would rise to the top and you had to shake your milk, you know, and shake it up real good and you had to pour it real fast and drink it real fast so it wouldn't separate again. But when they started homogenizing milk, you no longer have to shake your milk, you see. You just get out of the glass and drink it. Now, here's the thing. When God looks at us, he wants us to be homogenized as far as truth is concerned. We're supposed to believe the same thing. And if we don't believe the same thing, it's because someone is mistaken. And God doesn't honor all these erroneous ideas that we say, well, praise God for diversity. He doesn't praise God for diversity. He praises God for truth. He believes in truth. And so we're to be homogenized in the sense that we, we are uniform. It, we're, it mean, the word means make uniform, make similar. But we naturally want to separate. And so God sometimes has to shake Shake the jar, you know, to get us back in the right place. So we want unity. We don't want union. And we understand the, 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 the limitations of diversity, that, the, that good diversity is Christian liberty, which is governed by truth. Anyway, I hope that was helpful. Let's, uh, pray to, let's bow together. We're going to pray and go, and we'll see you next time. And Brother Gordon Fuller, would you please pray for us?